raucous group of people here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Not a huge crowd, but a loud crowd. Hi. Hey, uh, welcome to the Atheist Experience. Today's uh, June 23rd, 2019, uh, with the usual addendums after it. How are you? Good. Good to see you. I'm Matt Delaney, hosting this week's show, and joining me, Don Baker. Hey, good to be here. Uh, and now, so you've done this show actually longer than I have. A little bit, yeah. Like a year or Maybe so, yeah, something yeah. like that. Um, which means we've both been here for a decade and a half. Yeah, we're getting to be old timers. Uh, we wanted to talk about something. Don, of course, has a failure that we're going to get to, and then we'll get to calls, and I just wanted to take a few minutes. Um, th there's going to be a bunch of announcements in the, in the coming weeks on a number of different subjects, but there's one thing that I wanted to address, uh, which some of you are aware of and some of you are not. There are uh, four people who were previously on the Atheist Experience who have left the Atheist Experience. Some of them have left the ACA to go pursue their own interests and other things. Some of them are still involved in the ACA or taking a break or whatever else. And that would be Tracy, Jen, Phil, and John Igoletti. Uh, and you might be going, holy crap, that's like everybody except for you and Don. Uh, yes, which is one of the reasons why we added Jenna. Uh, but there was a lot, of, there, were, there were talk going back and people always trying to stir up drama. Uh, I wanted to make it clear, and, and I'm glad Don's here to join me kind of in this look back at the show. Uh, these people are our friends who dedicated, in some cases, 13 or more years of their life to doing something they loved, this show. They deserve nothing but our respect and thanks and our best wishes as they go forward to something else. And at some point, <gasps> it's not out of the realm of possibility that some of them might come back. They're not the first people to leave the show. Well, and Martin. they also made big contributions to the ACA, oh, yeah. all of them. Yeah. Well, I was just saying, Martin Wagner left the show, Ashley Perry left the show, Jeff D. left the show, Russell Glasser left the show. There have been, been lots of people who have been involved. This is a changing evolution. But in this case, with these four people, we have John, who was the treasurer of the ACA for 13, 14, 15, a gazillion D1 years. Uh, then you have a former president and vice president in Jen, mm -hmm. a former, uh, I, I believe, VP in... Uh, Tracy, but definitely a former VP and Phil. There's been so many position changes over the years. My big thing is that don't pay attention to the rumors. The only thing that matters is that there were four people who dedicated a huge chunk of their life to doing this show's mission. They were my friends. They are my friends. I appreciate everything they've done. I am sad to see some of them go. The show will continue, and we're hoping to, to make improvements and, and make things better. Um, and, and that's it. I mean, I can't possibly thank people enough. There were some people who were like, oh, you left, and that's a bad thing. No. If it turns, no matter what your reason is, like someday I'm going to leave the show. And my reason is probably going to be I'm either no longer able to do it or things have changed so much that what I want to do is now not the same thing as, as what's happening on the show. And when that comes, if anybody says anything other than, you know, thanks for the time you put in, don't let the door hit your ass on the way out, <laughs> I'll be uh, grateful. And, uh, but Don and I, as the two people who've been here the longest. In the current batch. In, yeah. Well, no. <laughs> in the previous batch, there's nobody that's done it as long as you and I have. Oh, really? I'll be darned. Yeah, because. Okay. Well, you're the trooper because you've been doing it nearly every week and. I'm, I'm on just occasionally. That's all right. You actually come with content. I just talk. So we'll, we'll call it a draw. You answer the phone really well. <laughs> but anyway, we, we wanted to say uh, no. <laughs> a special note to uh, Tracy, Phil, Jen, and John, uh, who are not part of the Atheist Experience now. Maybe they will be again in the future. Maybe not. We, we um, would welcome them back. Yeah. And, uh, and we're thrilled at the response that Jen has received. I, I, rem I saw Jenna for like two minutes and I was like, yeah, let's try her out on the show. And then she was here for one show and I'm like, oh, thank you. Yeah. Hey. Happy to have you. Okay. So uh, yeah, Don and I are doing the show. We got Jenna. We're looking for potentially another host, but we're going to have a lot of guests. And that's the point that I wanted to get to right before his fa uh, failure for this week is next Sunday, we will have Daryl Ray uh, on the show. For those of you who aren't familiar, we talk about recovering from religion, the organization all the time. That's Daryl's baby. Uh, he'll be down in the Austin and San Antonio area working both with the ACA on various shows and FACT, I, I believe it's FACT, uh, in San Antonio uh, on their stuff. Then the following week, it'll be um, possibly, we have to finish working out the details, 
me and Seth Andrews, because uh, that went so well last time, we thought we'd get some guests back. We are going to have some guests. We are going to be working on the, the tech to do some remote guests. I've got some people in mind. Um, but at the end of the day, this show's caller-driven. So it seems to me the key is to get as many good callers as we can. Yeah, yeah, we'll continue to do that. How, how did you stumble onto the atheist experience the first time? Let's see. Um, I became involved with the ACA and uh, immediately was drawn to the whole lecture scene because I, you know, I'm a, an academic or I used to be an academic. And uh, so I, I gave a number of lectures and uh, then they, they invited me onto the show, uh, Ashley and Martin, mm -hmm. back, back in the day and had me on as a guest and um, it didn't go badly. <laughs> And, I'll say. I got invited back again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, at some point, um, Martin and Ashley were doing the show as a pair for many, many weeks. They they were the host and co-host. And, right. and that's a, that takes a lot of stamina to do that every single week. And uh, they sort of cried uncle at some point and, and said, you know, we got to back off from this. And we went to a rotating co-host. Right. And rotating host. At one point, we had two hosts and five or six co-hosts. Right. And right. the biggest thing that bothered me was that means the co-host is going to be on every other month. Yeah, it, it's, it's a longer rotation. Um, but I think it's good in that we get a lot of different voices and pairs of voices and dynamics. And it makes the show a little more interesting to have rotation. The, by the way, the week after July 7th, uh, I won't be here. I have to go to Phoenix for a magic convention. Uh so even I don't know if it's on the schedule yet, but I'm belie I believe that the July twelfth weekend or whatever is going to be you and Jenna doing a show together. Okay, for sounds time. lovely. Well, we'll figure that out. On that note, you have a failure for us to consider I today. I do. I do. Uh, this Let me will, have it. This will be number uh, sixty four if you're keeping track. Um, so the Bible and Christian history are loaded with murder, torture, persecution, and atrocities. I bring this up fairly often. And how do Christians respond? Well, via lame rationalizations, of course. <laughs> and if you ever hear any of these rationalizations, you can be sure someone's trying to dodge responsibility for some evil. And there, th some of this has been in the news even lately. And if you believe these rationalizations, you're part of the problem. And if you utter them, you're aiding and abetting, as yep. far as I'm concerned. So um, there's actively perpetrating evil, arguing the evil Bible and spinning past evil. Um, actively perpetrating evil. There's a quote from Psalm 108, with God on our side, we will win. He will defeat our enemies. And so God is, God is on our side is, is the cry of folks that want to, you know, claim that they're on the, the side of righteousness, whether they are or not. And uh, It know, started off as the cry of the Jews. Because they were God's chosen people, and so they would continually saying God is on their side. But now it's kind of like, oi vey, God, what, what, are we, what are you doing with this? Right, right. And, of course, there's Gott mit uns, uh, the German uh, phrase, and you can look that up, what, how that was used. Um, there's uh, Ann Coulter who had a book called Godless, the Church of Li Liberalism. So, if, so the, if the other side doesn't have God, then you'd have God. And so it's, it's kind of her way of saying God is on her side. Um, so there's the claim of divine guidance, and um, I call bullshit, of course, because it would be helpful to prove that a God exists first, and then you can start using him for your advertising if he, if he consents, perhaps. But uh, <clears throat> it is true that God is party to some pretty evil shit in the Bible, and so maybe he is on your side. <laughs> Um, and uh, we're, on this, we're on the side of humanity. Uh, that, that's kind of an interesting <laughs> point, though, about whether or not God consented. Because if I were to go, like, on Twitter mm -hmm. and say, um, oh, something just outrageous, and then I said, Don Baker agrees with me, <laughs> and then you never said anything. Right. Your silence would be viewed as a tacit, tacit, tacit agreement. admission. Right. So... Uh, that's the only sort of agreement that we ever get from a God is this tacit silence. Right. Um, and so if there is a God, then he must be in agreement with all of the worst things that have been he's been yeah. saddled with because he hasn't bothered to set the record straight. That's right. I agree with that. That's right. Well, if you're arguing about the Bible, I, I often hear, well, that was the Old Testament. Mm. Uh, don't you love that? Aunt? It's my favorite. <laughs> 
And wasn't that the same perfect God that in the same moral code? Or are you calling God a screw up that he had to, you know, uh, come and fix things? And but God is a screw up. In the <laughs> he is a screw up. Yeah. It's like he starts and he, and, and then it goes bad. And then he, he says, oh, I got a way to fix it. And then it goes bad. And he's like, oh, I can fix that too. And then it goes bad. And he's like, fuck it. I'm going to have to kill everybody except for this family. And then it goes bad. And then, all right, well, instead of trying to save everybody, I'm just going to save the Jews. And then it goes bad. And it's a comedy of failures. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it would be a comedy if it weren't such a tragedy. And the stuff in the New Testament is far worse. Uh, uh, Jesus is follow him or be tortured. So that's that's pro- far worse than... than Why the, can't I do both? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. I would say you can. And if God needs to revise his perfect moral code, why not get the latest version, which might be the Koran or the Book of Mormon, right? You should be, you should be using those. Or the Book of Eric, which, which Eric must have taken with him because it's not here. Okay. Some, Vern filed some of the books. Um, so if God messed up the first time, and what makes you think you got it right the second time or the third time, or how can you trust any of it? The, the, one of the apologetics, of course, is that God didn't mess up at any of those times. It was flawed human beings that messed up, except that God's the one that created flawed human beings with the expectation that they weren't going to be flawed. So he fucked up even worse. Right. And then he punished the human beings for, for being, yeah. yeah. Uh, another phrase you hear is God had to change his message for the times, and that's often used with slavery. I don't, I don't think I need to unpack that. Um, when apologizing for Christianity's evil past, I hear those who weren't true Christians. Mm. They weren't. They weren't. You know, believers like I am. And this is, of, of course, a new, no true Scotsman fallacy, right? It's changing the moving the goalposts. And how do Christians differ through the times? Really, we have the same ho- holy book, the same blind faith, the same relationship with God, the same God. Blah blah blah. Um, and it always seems that this definition of true Christian is always changing and flapping in the wind depending on whatever is going to be self-serving for the person who's using this. And, sure. And that's how it is. And, you know, these, these people who have done evil might be ba- marching under the banner of Christianity, but if, you're, if you claim they're not true Christians, you guys need to figure out who is the true Christians and let us know. It's not, it's not the atheist's jobs to fix your, fix your problems. And, and it seems very clear to me that there will never be a Christianity test because there's just too damn much money to be made duping the gullible and, and, and casting a wide net and bringing in as many people as possible. So um, you guys could fix that if you wanted. Spinning past evils. Uh, here's another one. The devil made me do it. Uh, and, and this reminds me of the old Flip Wilson uh, sketches from the 70s. You have to be a certain age to, to remember these. But uh, he, he uh, portrayed a, a, a woman, Geraldine Jones, mm-hmm. who, who, had, uh, who had a phrase, the devil made me buy this dress. <laughs> and it was all very, very, very humorous. And, and he made the phrase, the devil made me do it, uh, a kind of a common phrase throughout the United States. I have a friend who's unlikely to see this, but I'm going to say this just for her be- benefit. Gangster rap made me do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So both with the, uh, the, the, the Vatican uh, abusive clergy uh, issue, uh, they've used uh, tools of Satan to describe, you know, the, this, this thing. And, you know, Satan's, Satan's in charge apparently. Um, here's, a, here's a quote. Because he's marvelous pope and worthy successor to John Paul II, it's clear the devil wants to grab hold of him concerning Pope Ratzinger. The, uh, recently in the Baptist uh, sex scandal has been excused as demonic. And my response to this is if the devil's running your organization, maybe they should be shut down so that they don't do any more harm. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> Uh, here's another one. We're all sinners. So uh, this is one of the most annoying ones to me. It's, it's like saying we're all human, but not all. Uh, some humans don't have to rationalize their evil shit because they're not doing it. So this is really kind of a lame excuse. And atheists, of course, don't recognize sin as a meaningful concept. We're not about sticking up our heads up the butt of an invisible mass murdering monster. And we do... We do recognize and infront humanity when we see one, and so screw the screw the sin stuff. Here's another one: "Thou shalt not judge." 
um, or God will get you for pointing out my evil. <laughs> and this is nothing more than an agreement between thugs. And uh, this, this nothing good can come from this attitude. And I want people to judge me. I want people to tell me when I'm screwing up so that I can make things better. And I want – I reserve the right to do the same. And that's how we make the world a better place. And that's kind of the basis of secular morality is, is we figure out what's wrong and we go fix it. Um, finally – uh, in conclusion, Christianity and other religions seem to be – have some challenges in the personal responsibility front. And since personal responsibility is not on the agenda, rationalization is the next best thing or is it is it best? I'm not so sure. Um, it seems to work OK with the gullible, the people that are known as sheep. And it does not work with atheists and people that have a strong moral compass. And there really is no excuse for this evil and so why double down and try to spin it? The actual evil and the lame rationalizations and spin are both failures of Christianity. Okay. Okay. And obviously nobody will bother disagreeing with that. So, uh, okay. We got some assent in the audience. Yay. Yay. <laughs> uh, we're going to go ahead and jump to calls. As a reminder, uh, we're here at the Free Thought Library in Austin, Texas. Where are you? Weren't you didn't you tell me you were going to be here today? Yeah. What's, um, anyway... This building's open seven days a week from uh, roughly 11 to 9 or so, and we're producing eight or nine different programs at any given time. There's something going on here at the building. And what happens on Sundays is that we do this Talk Heathen show, uh, which today ran like, oh, I don't know, an hour and some change uh, over seemingly. Yeah, we Jamie and I, we just went on and on. And okay. On. Yep. Uh, but then we do Atheist Experience, and then all those people who actually bothered to show up, who are on the other side of the glass and in the back room and out on the back porch viewing area, uh, we're going to have dinner. Just dinner. Okay. Like, I'm pretty sure today we're ordering pizza. Okay. There will be pizzas here uh, for people. If you're not in the Austin area, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you to move. Well, you can move here, but uh, you can visit. We get a surprising number of visitors. Yeah. By the way, show, show of hands, who on the other side of the glass it does not live in Austin? Uh, wow, about half, yeah. half of the folks. Or at least a third. Wow, that's great. Yeah, so that's what's, that's what's going on. Um, let's get to calls. Okay. Who, who would we like first? You want to go with John? Sure. John in San Antonio says that uh, you believe there's a lot of truth in the, or deep truth in the Bible despite human error. So thanks for calling. You're on with Matt and Don. Yeah. Yeah, hey, what's up? It's uh, me, John. Yeah, I, I just heard y'all talking, and I, I feel like, um, what is it called? Atheists have, like, a personal, what is it called, grudge against God or something? Uh, but, well, I, uh, I, don't, yeah, I don't have a personal do. grudge against God because I don't think God exists or is a person. I have a, yeah. what, what I don't like is when irrational and harmful beliefs are accepted by a good chunk of the population without good reason. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I was calling because I was, I was just saying basically that I don't think the Bible. I mean, I don't, I don't agree how he, I don't like how y'all ignore the fact that you know science, politics, and religion are very good tools of indoctrination and manipulation. But you're only focusing on, you know, the religious part of things, and and you. Well, this is an well, atheism this, show, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but that's the, my whole point. That's the, my whole point that the, the other thing is specific. that the other thing is that while you can be indoctrinated into any position, science is not an indoctrination process, and so while politics isn't a religion. No, science right. science is not a religion, nor is it an indoctrination process. That's mm. <laughs> funny. So you, you're te you're telling me, okay, hey, well that's a that's a that's your belief. Um, I don't want to argue about it, it. it. Well, then you shouldn't have called the show. <laughs> Yeah, hey, hey, no, because, yeah, that's, I was just calling to say that there is truth in the Bible and that... So what? Man there, there's, truth in a, there's truth in a Spider-Man comic, too. To, to yeah, just, to right, just it, call and say that there's something point, true in the Bible... It, is, it's easy to focus on all the things that, that is wrong, but what is right about it? It's easy it doesn't to matter what's right about it, things. because what's right about the Bible, doing, what's right, what, what are you doing what's, that's right, what's right, right about the Bible and true is irrelevant to whether or not the foundations of the Bible are true. So the Bible can say good things, like sell your belongings, give the money to the poor. 
But that doesn't mean that that message has come from a God or that that book has anything to tell us about how, what a God is or what a God wants or anything else. So the things that you could point to that are true in the Bible are trivial and they exist outside of the Bible. So it's not like you needed the Bible to find those things that are true. And if it's written by God, that's, shouldn't that's it all one, be true? That's one thing I always argue with people that are religious is that God is not just within the Bible, God is everywhere. And Well, it, I would argue that it, God it, is it, not it, necessarily it, in the Bible and apparently nowhere. <laughs> yeah, so so pr just, prove... You believe that. No, it's not I belief. Can't. No, 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 stop, John. I don't choose to... You keep doing this defensive thing of well, pretend, uh, shut up, <laughs> shut up. You keep doing this defensive thing of pretending you understand what I think and then demonstrating that you actually don't. You just said you don't believe in God. You said God is real, so that's a belief. I, I, no. You don't, say, you don't know that. You, you believe it. Saying, you can't prove I, oh my God, are you going to stop? I'm done. Saying I do not believe in God, but I'm willing for you to demonstrate evidence for the God you believe in, that's my position. God reveals himself to you. God reveals himself to us every day, but it's Prove it. to see it or not. Prove it. Prove to me that red is real. Unless you experience it, you'll never know it. Okay. If, I, if I'm blind, I, you can never tell me with words what you, red is. You are flat wrong in that... How, how would you explain red I, to me? If you stop fucking interrupting me and let me finish my sentence, I'd tell you. Do you I think that people who are colorblind cannot be shown that they are in fact colorblind? I didn't say that they were the fact that the color blind said they can't experience the color red. You, with words, you cannot, you cannot. Oh my God. The experience of red. I didn't say that they're not aware of the fact that they're colorblind. I'm not you're, fucking you're, you're, you're finished. The subject. I'm not finished. You would learn something if you would just let me finish. All right, I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm not going to talk to him. Let's say Don is colorblind and he can't tell the difference between red and green. He will never know what it's like to see red in the same way that I do. But it may be the case that nobody will ever know what it's like to see red in the way that I do. However, I can demonstrate conclusively to Don that there is a red and that there is a green and that people can, in fact, do discern this and that there is technology that can discern this in addition to just human senses. Correct. Oh wait! I want to. I want to rephrase. That's a thing. question. I'm asking. That's I'm, I'm, I'm going to rephrase. No, you're not. I, you no, you're not. Too long. Don't get no. The goal you're not. <laughs> this is a simple question. Can you simplify it again? A little with like less than. A whole Don's percent. colorblind. Don's colorblind, but I can demonstrate conclusively to him that red and green are actual things that he cannot how distinguish. You, how between. would you demonstrate that to me if I was blind? Because you're saying colorblind. I'm talking about somebody being blind, not able to see anything. Goodbye. See. Here's the thing, you have to do things in little bitty steps, and the second your brain recognizes that we've taken the first steps towards showing the second step and third step, which will show how absolutely asinine your position is, you go into dispensive mode and spin things around. So I'll do this for you. If someone happens to be red and green colorblind, they can't distinguish between red and green. We now understand the various causes for this, including defects within the eye as well. And if somebody is in fact red and green colorblind, I can demonstrate to them the truth that red exists and green exists, or that these are colors that other people can perceive. And we can do this both with human eyes in double blind experiments to hold up cards. Hey, is this red? Is this green? Is this red? Is this green? And show that people who can distinguish between red and green can get a 100% success rate in identifying and distinguishing between the two, even if Don can't. That's how I can demonstrate that red and green are there. If someone is totally blind, that still applies to them because they are now able to discern that someone can tell the difference between two things that they can't see at all. It's even more powerful to a blind person that, oh my gosh, not only can you people see and demonstrate that you can see through a test, but there are variations in things that I can't even comprehend because I can't see them. Your, your narrow view of the world that there would be no way to explain to someone who is incapable of seeing that other people can see is so monumentally stupid that it's embarrassing that we have to address it. Because we live in a world where for the entire history of human beings, we have had people who do not have sight and we've dealt with it. And all of them have accepted that they can't see and yet someone else can. It is a fairly trivial exercise to demonstrate this. And the fact that you want to go to that because your argument is, well, I've experienced God 
and you won't ever believe me until you experience God. Well, congratulations. If that's true, if the key is that you have done some experiment that proves God to you and I haven't, well, you may in fact be warranted. But until you demonstrate that to the rest of us who are blind, you're not. And it is just fundamentally, logically identical to, I am convinced I experienced this, I can't prove it to any of you, but I'm fucking right. <laughs> and how do we distinguish that from a delusion? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, you can't teach a blind person this. Yes, you can. All kinds of stuff. <laughs> People without sight are um, uh, just as brilliant and uh, able to understand these things as most anybody else other than you who called. <laughs> it's frustrating because I know the path that he's going down. I've experienced God. I understand you haven't. So I'm not going to hold that against you that you don't believe right. in God. God just hasn't deigned to demonstrate to you. Now, if you change those things, I can see things. I know that you can't. I'm sorry that nature has prevented you from seeing things, but you're just going to have to take my word for it that I can see things. Do you see the difference in the experimental process there? One is faith-based, bias, bald-ass assertion. And the other one is science, which isn't a fucking religion and isn't about indoctrination. It's a test methodology that removes those biases and removes the baggage that you are carrying around. Okay. Okay. Oh, you don't have to applaud for everything. We have Abel in Florida. Uh, does the Bible teach you how to be successful and motivated? Welcome to the show. You're on with Donna Matt. Hi, my name is Abel, and um, I am... Uh, kind of, you know, Christian, but not really, you know, deep religion. I just want to understand that does the Bible teach um, everybody how to be motivated, be successful? Like, you know, you know, like some people who start from scratch and they start to read the Bible and they help to be, continue growing, you know, motivated. Is that, is that possibly true? Well, you started the question with, does the Bible teach everybody? And so the, the answer to that is no, because not everybody's going to read or pay any attention to it or is even familiar with it. But if I understand your question, you're really saying, can we get useful guidance from a book like the Bible? Okay. Is that, is that the question? Yes, yes, sir. Sure, but the, the reason it's useful is not because it's in the Bible. It's useful because it's true. There are true things and useful things in all kinds of religions, but those things are true and useful okay. even if that religion is ultimately false. So the Bible can say things like, you know, don't murder, and Don and I are in agreement, murder's wrong. But we didn't need the Bible to reach that conclusion, and the Bible alone could never have got us there. Yeah, and I would add okay. that, that uh, the one glaring counterexample here is, is probably prayer, right? Uh, if if, if this, uh, there's this idea in the Bible that you can pray and get whatever you want, and that's, uh, you know, direct quotes from Jesus, supposedly, in a, in a number of places. And, Paul. And... Uh, you know, if you can pray for stuff, why why bother working for it? Why not just you know say God, give me, give me, give me? Um, and that seems to be kind of you know there's this yeah. there's this idea of secular humor and humanism, which basically says, hey, uh, we're the only guys around. We're, God's not going to solve our problems. We have to go do it ourselves. And what could be more motivating than that? Yeah, I, I personally it happened because, you know, sometimes I don't have to ask God all this thing. You know, I can do myself. Like, I'm okay, you know, because my parents, they kind of forced me to pray. And, you know, I'm not that. My parents, would, they don't force me to pray, but they just ask God what I want. I didn't, I told them, I, I don't need to ask God, you know, so. But um, there you go. I'm not trying to be, but, yeah. yeah. So, but sometimes the reason why I don't believe that kind of much is I think the Bible destroyed, um, the system, because like I remember when I was in middle school, uh, the book is called Salem Witch Trial. You remember that story? Salem sure. Witch Trials. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. it's more more than a story. And, it really happened. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is that like when I read it, I like huh, that's strange. It's, how come the people believe that kind of way? And then it's because of devil, whatever kind of shit. No, it's I'm because like, the Bible says, "Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live." The instruction is. Ex Presley in the Bible to kill witches. Exodus twenty something. Like it, it happened in the seventeen hundred. You know, um, 
And I'm like, whoa. And then I lean back and I try to, it's like a study understanding, um, you know, what does that mean? Studying the Bible a little bit. And, and I'm not reading a Bible. So I stopped reading a Bible and I'm kind of like a little bit agnostic, you know, and I'm, I might be an atheist if I want to, but, and I try my best. And well, to be, do, you, do you believe that God exists? Um, I don't know. It's, I don't know. Like, it's hard. Neither do I. Believe, you know, you know. You know, I try I, to figure I, well, out. I try. Well, I'm asking try, you about your you know. beliefs, and so you know, presumably you're the only one who could know that. Yeah, you're either convinced <laughs> some God exists, or you're not convinced. And if you're not convinced, then you're an atheist under some level, some label. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it could, could probably be true. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. Could um, it? You know, because I was because I have most of my family are very big religion, and I'm only one person don't. But yeah. they're not force me to, to, you know, they don't push me to pray. They don't force me to do all these things. I get they don't it. force me to go to church. So I just, you know, I just be careful not to, because what I believe, I believe like morality. I, I, I kind of deep into, into a philosophy way, what, in, what is the common sense, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So I sure. like some, you know, ethics. I said even in college, ethics is kind of mixed into me. Instead of like crazy, whatever, like, oh, you should ask God before you did this. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? You know, there's one so, thing you, there's one thing you said that, that I'd kind of like to push back on for you to think about is you said, yeah. well, it's possible. Well, how did you determine that it was possible that for a God to exist? Well, um, sometimes people believe, uh, you know, they think it's, um, you know, like, um, 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 and when I look at it, it's, it's, it's very, people believe that way. Um, what, you know, they think it's a spirit, if they come to them, you know, I don't know. I, I can't, I can't even explain that way. God, God is the, that. is the label that people apply when they don't know something. So it's like, yeah. it's but like, I mean, let's imagine that I have a pair of dice behind my back and I roll them and I ask you, is it possible that I just rolled a 27? No. Actually it is because I didn't say they were six sided dice. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So if you I have dice, them, <laughs> but let's say I have two six-sided dice in my hand and you don't know that. And I say, I'm going to throw these dice. Is it possible for me to roll a 24? Now, with you not knowing how many sides are on the dice, your temptation, because you know it's possible if I have like a 20-sider and a six-sider, you know that's possible under that scenario. And so the temptation is to okay. say, hey, yeah, it, it is possible. And then when I show you that I have two six-siders, now you know it actually wasn't possible despite the fact that you reached the conclusion that it was. This is, the, this is the, the potential error that I'm cautioning you to consider, that when you say something is possible, you need to be able to demonstrate that. Just the same as when you say something is impossible. Okay. And, and, and if so, you don't have uh, enough information to reach the conclusion, then the one and only right answer is, I don't know if that's possible or not. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm trying to learn, you know, that's, I'm not, I'm not like, you know, uh, you know, I'm not that kind of other religion, you know, argue with you. I just understand your perspective. That's all I want to know. That's so, yeah. Um, Let me throw something else out, yeah. out at you. Um, there's yeah. often a presumption that there's a single God and, and, and that it's the Christian God. And it's like, no, not necessarily. Mankind is made, made up, you know, all sorts of gods and, uh, Different religions have different sorts of gods, and they're all incompatible with each other. Um, and so, which god are you talking about? Yeah, it's one of those things. That, um, yeah, we got to we got to figure out which god is possible. Then, which one out of all the possible gods? Which right now, I think the set is as close to zero as possible to demonstrate possibility of a god. Then you got to go. Okay, which one are we talking about? Yep. And okay, that's why. So it's like the previous caller who was trying to pretend that he could read my mind, and it happened over and over again on nonprofits where I was just, you've never even considered this. And I'm like, bitch, how do you know what I've fucking considered? I've been doing this for 15 to 20 years, and you think that I haven't considered the most basic question about, oh, have you thought about, is it possible that no gods exist? You know, it's one of those things, I get it, people are at different stages, people have access different information. We are all, including me and Don and everybody else, still learning stuff. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, mistakes can all I the time. be honest with you? Yep. Yeah. I mean, where I came from, I'm from Ethiopia. Um, Ethiopia is one of the most 
deep religion country in ever. So there's not a lot of atheists who ever become an Ethiopian. They're not a lot of Ethiopians became atheists because they're afraid it's going to happen to them, it's going to hurt them. Yeah. So I'm glad I'm in the United States. I can say whatever I want to say, you know. Yeah, isn't that nice? Yeah, yes. Yeah. It, that is one of, a, one of our that. great freedoms for sure. Yeah. On that so note, I'm Abel. So glad. On that note, Abel, we're going to let you go so we can move on to some other callers. Keep thinking about it. Call us back if you have other questions or if you come across some new insight or whatever. But, yeah, keep exercising the freedom to use your brain and uh, explore things and to speak your mind. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah, it's funny because I, I remember a call. Oh, we had somebody talking about censorship earlier and so we had this discussion and uh Vern printed up a little XKCD comic to hand out but uh it is impossible for me to censor you censorship comes from the government if i hang up on you uh that's no different from if you came over to my house and started saying stuff i didn't like i get to remove you from my house that's yeah. that's the way that goes it's not censorship you can stand out on the street until my neighbors call the cops uh, and then you can go find another street that's, you know, public and stand there with your sandwich board screaming about how the end is nigh. And, or you can even go join one of those independent Baptist pumpkin-loving churches that are out to kill all the homosexuals. Uh, the LGBTQ community just needs to die, according to uh, uh, these people. Um, yeah. Or you can choose to do what I do, which is every time those little nasty-ass bigots show up and start talking shit about people, I will now put on Taylor Swift's new song, You Need to Calm Down, which is turning me into a much calmer person okay. in general. That is it's a, a video is you a, should go watch. It's awesome. Okay. Matt showed it to me just now. It was awesome. Good stuff. <laughs> We've got uh, David in Georgia. You're on with Donna Matt. Hey, guys. How's it going? Good. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I've seen a lot on y'all's show where y'all sit there and bring up the subject of slavery. I was just asking, does the atheist have the moral high ground in regards to slavery? I do. I've never enslaved anybody. I've never advocated for slavery. I have an understanding of morality, and I should be able to preach about anything that is demonstrably immoral. What, what qualifications, oh. what, hang on, what qualifications would someone need to point out that slavery is an injustice? Well, my thing is, is like you were just mentioning your home. So if we went to your house and checked all your goods, your shoes, your electronics, your computers, your cell phones, your groceries, everything in your house. And if we backtrace it and we can see which Department of Labor statistics show that it's made by uh, slave labor, child slave labor. Wouldn't that make you an agreement in accordance with slave labor since you purchased those goods? If I was actually aware of it and didn't take actions, then I'm at least somewhat complicit. But I'm not one. There's a difference between someone saying it is okay to own people as property and someone merely being a consumer of goods that are discovered to be through uh, inappropriate. And actually, in most of those cases, uh, it's whether or not that counts as slavery as property. This is just abuse of humans in general. But well, like I said, the I mean, high ground here, the God. high ground here isn't I've never bought an item that was ultimately manufactured by children working in terrible conditions. The high ground is in saying we should not live in a world and we should not advocate for a world that permits children and others to work in unacceptable conditions. That's well, like if you continue to buy the, buy the products made by this labor, you're a perpetuator of the system and therefore have no moral high ground whatsoever to condone slavery because you support it. Okay, well, then I don't have any reason to talk to you because if you're going to equivocate to the point where anybody who might, who might be actively opposed to this and yet is incidentally guilty because they bought something and equate that with a book supposedly giving a message from God to say, thou shalt buy thy slaves from the heathen who surround you, this is like... If I, if I got a, a, a new car and uh, somebody wrecked it and we went to court and the jury gave me an, an incredibly good verdict and I managed to get, you know, after that car accident to live the rest of my life without working in a nice house with a nice car because I was injured and this jury decided to award that verdict. That would be like you coming to me afterward and say, hey, you know some of those juries, they'd been in car accidents before, and they were just pissed off about that they didn't get anything out of it, so they gave it to you. 
That doesn't mean that I am advocating for vigilante justice. It doesn't mean I'm advocating for jury nullification. It doesn't mean that I'm advocating for outrageous jury awards. It just means that you've pointed to something where I've benefited from something. But if you have someone who's standing here saying slavery is wrong, and you have a person next to them standing there saying slavery is right, and you point at both of us and say, yeah, well, you both have Nikes that were made by children working in slave conditions, you're missing the fucking point. So, so David, uh, is slavery wrong? Is slavery wrong? Yes, it is. Okay. Was, was your God, was, was the Christian God wrong to, uh, to advocate for it? Can you show me in the Bible where slavery exists? Where sure. slavery exists or where the, where the yes, Bible, please. Yes, please. Or, or where the Bible advocates slavery? Either or. Take your pick. Exodus 21. Exodus 21. Correct. You got a King James Bible handy? Sure. I got every Bible handy. There's an internet. Do we, you uh, want us to read it to you? Uh, yes. Please give me the verse that advocates for slavery in the Bible. And then uh, King James, Jesus uh, in... Well, we're wasting time because I have addressed this seemingly every week, but I have a video on my YouTube channel. No, the, the, hey, shut the, up and let me finish. Uh, no, you didn't let me finish. <laughs> Goodbye, jackass. I'm done wasting time on this. We talk about it every week. And every week I show that I'm right. And every week somebody accuses me of being disingenuous when they are. And somebody accuses me of taking it out of context when they are. I've already done a video. If you go to YouTube and search for Atheist Debates Slavery, you will find me... Not just pointing to what the Bible says, but reading it, showing the context, and going verse by fucking verse through this. There's absolutely no reason for me to waste time on the 50th slavery apologist who wants to call the show to pull up the verses in Exodus 21 that specifically allow you to buy the heathen from the slave, or buy your slaves from the heathen that surround you, that you can beat slaves as long as they don't die within a day or two, uh, that they are your property, they are your money, you're not to be punished if something happens to them, other than you let them go if you put out their eye, et cetera. Uh, that there are different rules for Hebrew slaves than there are for non-Hebrew slaves, that you have to let them go after seven years or you can trick fuck them into actually being your slaves forever by getting them married because you have to let the man go, but you don't have to let the woman go. And if he wants to stay with his wife, then he has to come forward and say, hey, I love my master and I don't want to be free, in which case you put his ear to the door, you drive a spike through it to pierce the ear to show that he's now your property forever and immune from this seven-year thing. And then I'm sure you'll come back with the yeah, but the 50 years. And you'll come back with the yeah, but that's not God saying you can have slaves. But Jesus doubles it down is. on it too right, later Jesus on. Jesus never actually acknowledges anything about it, doesn't bother to correct it. Paul doubles oh. down on it and says that you should obey, slaves obey your masters in the Lord for this is good, okay. even though the cruel ones. Uh, I don't need to go through this all. Matter of fact, here's what I'd like to do. Somebody on the other side of this wall, and they'll put up a picture any second here while I'm talking, are the people who actually make the show happen. They're back there handling the video, handling the audio, Yay. doing the call screening. There they are. Those people are awesome. Uh, quick note, write it on a post-it for Mark or whatever. I want a fucking graphic that we can put up that just shows the slavery video with a link, give me a tiny URL for it, and every time some jackass calls asking me to pull up Exodus 21 and read it to him again, I can say, here's the video, here's the link to the video, go read it yourself, I'm not here to do your fucking homework for you. That's where we're going on that. Yeah, just because they, they pretend it doesn't exist in your church doesn't mean it's not in the Bible. <laughs> I have, in fact, already done your homework for you, which is how I'm not you. Uh, we've got... Brian in Las Vegas, one of my, my probably my second favorite town. You're on with Matt and Don. Uh, yes. How you doing? Can you hear me? Yes. I think I heard Don say he hates Las Vegas. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. I like it because uh, all the magic's there. Pleased to be here. I just want to be real quick. I just wanted to put out four points that uh, everybody could think about. Okay. Uh, the first point I wanted to put out is minds only come from other minds. The second point I wanted to put out is punks. I'm not sure I even understand that. The well, second, any, anytime the, there's this, an existence of a mind, it only comes through from another life force or mind. It never comes through non-biological process. Well, well, you know, I, we I would agree that we're aware of no minds that have not come through a biological process. But except for we're, we're working very hard on AI, which is going to be potentially a silicon version of it. Right? Which is not a biological process. Right. 
But but AI is also not won't be self aware though. It won't feel. It won't have. How a do you know that? We, we don't know. I, I don't know how you could just assert that because I don't know what the answer is. I don't see any reason That's why. True. AI AI is, is like it would be like a computer, but it's, it's not going to be self aware. How do you know that? Be chemical reactive. How do you know that? Because it's because it's, it's, it's just matter without a soul. AI. Okay. Uh oh. Now <laughs> now we're there. We've gone off the rails. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Time to reel you back in here. We don't believe there's a soul. Okay. And I have a mind, and I don't see anything that is contingent upon a soul or any demonstration of a soul. So you've entered a new word into the conversation in order to undergird your assertion that AI won't be self-aware. But th okay. that is like assuming... To to next point. That is assuming uh -huh. facts, not in evidence. So it just becomes an assertion. Okay. Okay, so we have some issues uh, with your first one. What's your second one? My second one is pumps, such as like a fuel pump, oil pump. Pumps only come from a designer. So anytime there's a pump, it only comes by design. That's not that's true. By purpose. <laughs> that, that, that's just not true. You could look at my heart as a pump, and there's no evidence that it was designed uh, at all. And I was getting to that. Uh, I was getting to that. Now, the pump has a purpose. The heart has a purpose. Does no, it? We never see. Yes. Yes. No. Blood through your body. No. No, 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 no. No. Stop. Purpose. Stop. Purpose. Stop. You are describing what it does. Purpose. Yes, that's the purpose. Oh, my. No. Stop. You are describing what it does. Purpose yes. is... Oh, my God. <laughs> I love it. Purpose love it. is different. So, if I take a hammer... Purpose and function are different. If I take a hammer, which was designed for the purpose of hammering nails, and I use it to club a baby seal, am I using it for its purpose? No. But it's still a function. So in order to demonstrate that there is function with purpose, you have to actually demonstrate that. You don't just get to assert. Just like you say, there can't be self-awareness without a soul. Now you're saying there can't be function without a purpose. And that's simply not true. I, you know, what's the purpose? Some things have multi-purposes, things that we invent and create. But what's the purpose of a tree? There's no evidence that there was an intent to put a plant down that converts carbon dioxide to oxygen. That's what it does. That is one of many things that a tree does, but you have no evidence that this was an intended purpose of a tree. Now I want to go back on that hammer because the hammer, the hammer is is ha only operates through somebody making an intent with it. Now if it's built for nails and hammers, and somebody says I'm going to club a baby, that's a choice. the The heart doesn't have a choice; it just simply has a purpose. That's totally different. I, I understand. That's why I went to the tree example. I picked two to put a button on this to show why you can't just assume an intentional purpose. And, and pumps only come from minds and another life force. Okay, just like a heart. Okay, you're 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 zero for two so far. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the fact the fact that a pump. The fact that something can, that can be described as a punk, pump only comes from an intentional purpose of a mind yes. or natural processes, right? There, there's no pump that only that comes from a non-biological process. No, no, I didn't say I didn't say non-biological. I said fucking natural. But the only time you could get biology is with life, and life comes through about apart from just simply non. You have no process. You have no idea how life came about. Doesn't do it came by a life force, another life force. You don't know That's that. How can you demonstrate life. that? What's a life because force? We see that in observable evidence. No, this is the natural world all the no, time. No, 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 no. This is this is this is a mistake. This is a fallacy. The fact that true. Stop. The fact that we observe Jesus. I swear, just fucking stop for a second. This is easy. Go ahead. The fact that we have observed something, let's say a thousand times, where A always leads, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. We observe something. Business, if you would fine, shut up and let me finish, because here's the thing, here's the thing with the audio. The second you say something, and the, with the history of the callers, see, perfect, this is the perfect example. I'm gonna put you on hold. I will take you off hold in a second. Let's assume that for 15 years, Every time I'm in mid-sentence and I hear a sound come through my earbuds, 
it's been somebody desperate to interrupt me to continue down their path. It's reasonable for me to assume that that's what you're doing, even if all you wanted to do was just agree with me. But the fact that I have that bulk of experience of A always leads to B doesn't mean that A always leads to B or that B is always the result of A. It could be the case that you were simply saying, I agree, continue. So it's a mistake for me to assume that because I've seen a particular pattern, that that is necessarily required. You could look at it as the black swan fallacy. If every swan you've ever seen is white, you might be tempted to say there are no black swans and you would be wrong. And so if every pump you've ever seen comes about by biological processes or right. by the intent of a mind, you could reasonably yeah. get to that point that that's what happens, but you would be wrong. You would be fallacious. You cannot. Not, all, not, necessarily, you cannot, not necessarily. Yes, necessarily. It's a fucking fallacy. We, we, see, we see these observations a billion, zillion times a day all over the world. And there's not another odd alternative. You know what you we've never to, seen? You, you know what we've never seen? What? A god or a god doing anything? Or a life force or a soul? Who says you have to see <laughs> <laughs> Who says you have to see him? Word, his, word, his word is unseen. He's I have no unseen. demonstration that he has any word. You are once again assuming facts, not in evidence. That's my video for this week is assuming facts, he, not in he, evidence. He spoke into your heart. Your heart is... How do you know that? that Prove it. Prove it. Because it's a pump. Because it's a Prove pump. it. No pumps. No pumps come That's a that fallacy. Pump. How can you know God in your heart if it's made for pumping? That's a fallacy. It's a logical <laughs> fallacy. This is an undeniable... <laughs> what you say? How can you know God in your heart if it's Here's made for pumping? And laugh. He spoke <laughs> the right now, I'm talking about the physical pump. No pumps come through... Uh, pumps only come through design. Prove it. We, we see it every day. What do you no, think? no, no. We've seen that pumps come from design, not pumps only come from design. That is the assertion that is a fallacy on your part. Fucking prove it. What, what, do, you want, what do you want me to do? Do backflips or something? I don't know. I'm, you I'm not the one here. I'm not the one calling in to make a statement that I can't fucking defend. But I, I, oh, I defend it. Go, go out and see every heart. Every pump, it only came from a designer. You can't get around that. Go ahead. Go around. Look, every swan you see is white. You can't get around that no, until I'm you not, do. We're not talking about swans. We're not talking about swans. Yes, we are. Every, yes, we are. Every pump, every pump. Yes, we are. Pump in, in a All right, I'm talking about swans. You're not talking about shit. <laughs> If every swan I've ever seen is white, that doesn't mean that all swans are white. If every pump I've ever seen comes about through a biological process, that doesn't mean that every pump comes through biological process. If every pump that I am interact with has been the result of a mind, that doesn't mean that there isn't something that also is a pump that is not the result of a mind. But at the end of the day, when you look at the function of the physical body, there are things we know and things we don't know. But you know what we definitely don't know? We have zero evidence that any supernatural being or event has ever interceded and affected anything in the history of humanity. That is an inference that you are making based on a fallacious set of reasoning. That's it. It's undeniable. The fallacy is the fallacy. That doesn't mean you're wrong. Here's the, here's the important thing people need to get about fallacies. If I put together a logical argument in, in structure where I've got a syllogism, two premises, one conclusion, as long as the structure is valid and I put true premises in, the conclusion must be true. But if either the premise is not true or the structure is such that it is invalid, I have no idea whether the conclusion is true or not. So if you say all pumps have to come from a mind and your reasoning is every pump I've ever seen comes from a mind, that's a fallacy. It's like saying all swans are white because all I've ever seen is white swans. And that's going to be true right up until you go to Australia where there are black swans and perhaps other places now too like a zoo. This is the fallacy. What it means is you're not wrong. It means that your reasoning is flawed. Because let's say, instead of all swans are white, you said all humans are mortal. Because every human we've ever seen is mortal. That's a reasonable inference. It's not based on every human we've ever seen is mortal. Because that's simply not true. Don's not dead and I'm not dead. So we don't know if we're mortal yet. We can infer reasonably that we're mortal for good reasons. But what if we found somebody, somebody or something or something like a tardigrade that may or may not be mortal? 
Maybe there's a biological thing that has never died. All you can do is get to the point where you say, hmm, it seems to be a reasonable inference that Don and I are going to die because every human being's died. We certainly can't be absolutely certain about that. But what it means is Jesus didn't come back from the dead. Because, <laughs> you know, all humans are mortal, right? Oh, well, Jesus wasn't human. Well, prove it. <laughs> well, it says so in the book. Okay. We can do this all... We, not only can we do this all day... Is he alive do, or is he dead? I'm not quite sure. He's like, he's like Schrodinger's God. <laughs> Schrodinger's God. Yeah. Hey, we've got uh, Frank in Dallas, Texas. You're on with Matt and Don. Oh, can't hear you. You guys, um, you had to come down short because of the audio difficulty from the security public system. I can't understand what you're saying. Okay. Can, is it still bad audio? Or oh, oh, that's better. Better all? now. Thank you. Keep, keep talking okay. and I guess Vern will try and fix it. Try to get it. your question out. Yeah, um, I called three weeks ago, spoke with you, but you guys had to cut me off again because of bad audio difficulties. Uh, you had also said that we were kind of in consensus because I had maintained that critical thinking was the best way to approach uh, most of these discussions. I had kind of misstated that it was an all-powerful force, and you had corrected me on that. What I should have said was that it's an all-encompassing weapon with, with which to approach all human problems. Um, back in December... I don't, I don't know, know, that's a big claim. Numbers, but, yeah, I, you know, think, I think it's I, a powerful well, I, weapon. But I think there are maybe exceptions to that. I, I'm, a, I'm a huge proponent of critical thinking and teaching critical thinking in schools and not as an elective because getting people to understand sound reasoning and evidence so that they're better reaching conclusions is a good thing. But Absolutely. I, I can sit around and think critical, critically about all kinds of stuff. And sometimes there are scenarios where I may not be able to get to any sort of answer, and yet I need to. So... If I meet someone new and they're like, hey, do you want to go out and have dinner? I could sit around and analyze that and weigh the pros and cons <laughs> and investigate this. But ultimately, it comes down to do I actually want to go down to dinner? So I'd rather just answer that question and say, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I absolutely agree that the critical thinking takes way more time and effort than ordinary you know, daily thinking and we don't have to think critically 100% of the time. Yeah. You know, probably 85, 95% of the time, we can just do what we've always done, and we don't have to resort to critical thinking. This is what... But I hear your frustration. This is what Sagan... Your frustration. This is what Sagan was talking about by training your baloney detection kit. Uh, you use critical thinking such that your visceral inferences are more likely to be correct, not that they're necessarily going to be correct. Exactly. And you also bring up a good point that you say critical thinking will not necessarily lead you to a truth. My point is that it at least keeps you from indulging in the logical fallacies and the cognitive biases, yeah. which are obviously frustrating you with these other callers. Yeah, when, when properly yeah. applied, you know, it, we're, we're fallible humans. Uh, we make mistakes. and Yeah, investi the reason I bring in the proper investigation and critical thinking, if you're walking across a football field that's been laced with mines, there's no guarantee that your exercise of critical thinking is going to help you find the path across that field. But proper investigation and critical thinking will increase your chances of avoiding the mines. Exactly. And that, that's like you're saying. You, you advocate teaching critical thinking in schools. If everybody was at least familiar with a, least, a list of logical fallacies and cognitive biases, mm -hmm. they could not only recognize it in the other person's arguments, but also recognize it in their own. Yep. And when they realize that they are indulging in these poor, poor reasoning processes, sometimes they can correct themselves even before you or somebody else who's discussing things can correct them. Right. Yeah, and, and that's, yep. that's the perfect thing. So like the last caller, if he had a good understanding of logical fallacies, then... Even if he committed one, I would be able to point it out and say, here's the fallacy and here's why, and you would get immediately assent to, oh, yeah, You'd crap. you have a much better conversation. That's happened to me live on stage in the middle of a debate where I thought I had solved the Izzat problem, and John Ferrer correctly challenged me that I was actually smuggling an ought in and showed the fallacious reasoning, and I was like, oh, yeah, 
because you're, it's not that you're always going to see it. It's that when somebody shines a light on it, you should be able to see it. And what happens frequently on the show is I shine five lights on something, and then somebody goes, nope, that's not <laughs> it. No, 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 because every of these. It, was, it happened on, non on um, uh, Talk Ethan today where I pointed out that somebody was shifting the burden of proof, and he literally said, or I'm not going to say literally, let me back up. This is as close to paraphrasing as I can get. I'm not shifting the burden of proof. I'm just expecting you to prove me wrong before I'll change my mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like with Brian, the last caller who was talking about the heart has to have a purpose and therefore a designer, you correctly pointed out, okay, this is the black swan fallacy. Now, if Brian already had known about the black swan fallacy, and you pointed it out to him, if he was intellectually honest, he would say, oh, crap, yeah, you got me. I was wrong. And yeah, sometimes that happens. Pretty obvious. Exactly, and you're lucky when it does. Yeah. Now, back in December, Matt had given a both a talk and I think a magic show in Dallas-Fort Worth at the Metroplex Atheist yep. for the winter solstice party. Yep. It and was... afterwards, uh, you were relaxing at the uh, Radisson Hotel lobby. I walked up to you and I handed you a copy of my book, The Final Pattern, The Critical right. Need for Critical Thinking. Yep. I don't know if you've had an a chance to read that. I, I have not, but it is still sitting on the nightstand next to my bed in the, you know, do this next okay. category. Now, you, you're probably familiar with Peter Bogosian. Yes. He's a philosophy professor at Portland State University. I went to see a talk of his. One of the very first slides that he had in this presentation was just the word facts, F-A-C-T-S, with a huge X through it. And he asked everybody in the audience, Please not take a picture of that with him on stage. He didn't want them saying, oh, Peter thinks the facts aren't important. But he went on to say, no, this means don't waste your time with facts. Yeah, I fundamentally disagree with him. Well, I mean, when he wrote the book, you know, A Manual for Creating Atheists. I, Which I isn't what that book is. is. Exactly. It's A Manual for Creating Critical Thinkers. Maybe. But his, his approach is not to attack what facts they believe in or even their beliefs themselves, like you guys ask, you know, they tell us what you believe and why. Yes. He focuses on the why, the epistemology. Yes, what that's that led you my focus that? as well. The why is the important part. Exactly. And again, that's, that's why I wrote my book, because it, it centers on the biases that everybody has, you, me, and everybody else. We all want to think that how we were raised and the facts that we have come across must be the truth. And so when, you, when you're frustrated with these other callers saying, hey, this is my bias, you have to point out their biases. You have to spin your wheels over and over again, an incredibly frustrating process, because the caller will not acknowledge their own biases to begin with. Yeah, but we don't you get to choose to our callers, back. right? They, they choose us. So exactly. some, some, callers, some callers do have the temerity to point out and acknowledge when we've exposed a particular bias or a flaw, and some don't. But the one concern here is I don't do this show for the person that I'm on the phone with. I do it for the thousands of other people who share their views who are sitting back watching in relative safety, watching that other person get exposed as being unreasonable because that's an incredibly uncomfortable position for the rest of them to be in. I'm almost never trying to change the person's mind that I'm on the phone with. I'm trying to do the best job I can to potentially change their mind so the people who are not in the spotlight, because we know that if someone has publicly professed a belief, they are now less likely to change it under any circumstances. And in some cases, pointing out that they are factually wrong will cause them to just double down. And so while it's nice when, when a caller is willing to engage honestly and acknowledge uh, errors, Mistake. et cetera, yeah. mm -hmm. that's not... Uh, the, sorry, callers, you are a tool for me to reach everybody else who shares your views. <laughs> You don't have a, I, I, by I the way, agree. that that is a function, not your purpose. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like you say, they, they become defensive and you spend all your time trying to get around that defensiveness. And that's why I think you and I are in the, in kind of the same page when we say teaching critical thinking and recognizing these fallacies and biases is step one. You can't really have a very constructive discussion or at least poke the change you're, you're, you're never going to call, or you're, like so, you're never going to convince the caller. This is, like to say, when, this is really, this is really subtle, but there, there's one.
tiny thing that I disagree with that on, and that is it takes multiple approaches. For the people who are willing to acknowledge their biases when you point them out, cool, do that. For the people who are, un there are people who are unwilling to acknowledge their biases who may be willing to say, oh, yeah, that is in fact a logical fallacy. Let me rework the argument. They may never get to the point where they recognize the biases that are leading them in the wrong direction, but if they are at least um, uh, honest and open in, in, in addressing things in a logical, reasonable fashion, they may get there. So, at, you know, there's this old statement for lawyers, which is when the facts are on your side, argue the facts. When the law is on your side, argue the law. And when neither the facts and law are on your side, pound the table as hard as you can. My thing is... When the facts seem to be the sort of thing that might compel someone, present the facts. When exposing their bias might be the thing that is going to compel someone, expose that bias. When, when pointing out logical fallacies might be the thing that changes somebody's mind, do that. I want as many different approaches as we need to reach as many people as possible. T totally agree. And like you say, everybody comes at it from a different angle. Um, my, my only contention is that I feel... That when I hear your frustration, and I'm frustrated listening to your discussions with a lot of uh, believers as well, I say, well, again, if, you're, if all you're going to do is be hammering against their biases and the way that they're already coming and their defensiveness, you know, it can be very entertaining, but ultimately, ultimately it's frustrating. But I, I agree that it's the listeners, the listeners that are listening that don't have to be defensive themselves, yep. which make something out of it. Yep. So I totally agree with that. My contention is just that if everybody were to learn logical fallacies, cognitive biases, the same way that they learn not to employ a double negative in speech or to contend that two plus two equals five, then it would be so obvious in, in all rhetoric, in all discussions, and all um, debates. Yeah, it would be the end of the show. Head shows. There, there would exactly, which is yeah. what you want. Yeah, which is what you want. So you, you and, and frankly want everyone. I, I, I don't want to be I don't want to be rude about this, but you and I are in agreement, either ninety plus percent or whatever. Uh, I'm going to switch back to some other calls where I might be in much more disagreement. That's fine. Please read the book. Thank I, you. I will. Thank you, Thank sir. You, I appreciate you. it. Oh, all right. So we've got. Uh, we're not taking. By the way, the, the, there are five people who are currently in the queue on hold. We're, we are going to get to all five of you, and uh, we're not going to bother adding but in the queue because I already did a, a long episode of Talk Heathen. Okay. Uh, and then after that's over, we'll be out back for pizza and whatnot. But who do you want next? Oh, my goodness. Let's take the oldest one. How about that? Um, Melanie? Sure. Melanie in Ottawa, you're on with Matt and Don. Hi, guys. You're a trooper. You've been on the phone a long Mike. time. <laughs> yeah, I have. Um, this might be a short call, actually. Um, my problem is um, the people around me. Um, Mine, too. <laughs> <laughs> Hell is other people. <laughs> yeah, I love humanity. I, I'm sorry, Melanie. Hopefully that lightens it's things up a bit. That, they give me trouble. <laughs> what's, what's going on with the people around you that's bugging you? Well, I, I accidentally came back out again as an atheist, and I'm, I'm again for like the second time in my life, um, being ostracized. Um, you know, they're trying to flip me back over and recruit me again, and you know, I'm losing friends. Those ones I don't really mind about, but um, when it comes to family and very close friends, um, it becomes an issue because I don't want to lose those people from my life, but I also need a way of being who I am without losing you know i mean it's so so the context you know, is is friends and family mostly those are the most important to me those are the right. ones i can't just discard so i mean really i i just don't know like i've i've tried counseling and so on but i still have to deal with with these people day in and day out uh what do you guys do or or are there you know i mean i've talked to counselors and so on but I just have no way of really having a coping mechanism. Well, it, it is. Uh, it does well. take a lot of energy to to debate all the time, right? And and you you may just want to be yourself with your friends and family and just enjoy their company and not have religious discussions. So so maybe one suggestion would be to say, hey. Uh, 
let's agree to disagree on this subject and talk about other things and, and focus on things you, you do like to do together. I'm, I'm going to say that agree to disagree is one of the phrases that I hate the most, but Aww. I don't disagree with what Don is saying. Um, I will agree. So usually when somebody says, hey, let's agree to disagree, that's because they just lost an argument and have nothing else to say and really don't want to keep engaging. Uh, and what I'd rather say is I will agree that we do disagree and that you're fucking wrong, but <laughs> there's no easy answer for this. I have friends and family where the subject of religions and gods virtually never comes up because my interactions with them have nothing to do with that and they don't care about that stuff that much. There are other people where we, we know that we disagree and we just maintain conversations that don't put us in a place where we're going to get in fights. It's like, it's like living in a house w with half of them being UT fans and the other being miserable, terrible Aggies. <laughs> Um, yeah. I, I actually M's fighting word. for the record <laughs> that's a bit of fun because I don't give a rat's ass about sports ball or universities at all I'm neither a UT fan nor an Aggie fan but I knew it would rile some people up <laughs> but the other thing and this is the hard part you go. you're probably going to have to get better at figuring out who in your life is actually a toxic negative influence and cutting them out it sucks. I've had to cut people out of my life who I genuinely love and care about because they could just could not let this stuff go. When I read my 50th birthday card thing from my parents, fortunately, I have not had to cut them from my life. I still interact with them. But my foot has most firmly been put down. And if I had had to say mom and dad are no longer a part of my life, I was comfortable with that as a possibility. It wasn't what I wanted to happen but I was willing to accept that that happened. Fortunately, we didn't have to go down that route. It's one of the most difficult things you can do. But what might make it easier is this. When you reach the point where there's someone you love who is making you so miserable that you feel you would be better off without them in your life, they did that and they already didn't love you enough to not do that. They have a perverted view of what love is. Love is, oh, you need to be the person I want you to be. You need to agree with me on this. I can't count the number of times I've had Beth and other people would get messages from family members. You know, we're praying for you to come back to Jesus so that you can be a part of our family again because we love you, we love you. We... Fuck that. Aggressive. You don't yeah. know what love is. Yeah. What you are doing is being an emotionally abusive manipulator. And when you realize that that's what those people are doing, that they don't love you, they love what they want you to be, it makes it a lot easier to cut them out of your life. It doesn't make it easy. It just makes it easier. And maybe before that stage, you can set some boundaries and say, hey, yeah. you know, this this is not something I want to talk about yeah. or, or you know. I would rather we don't discuss this topic because I would rather, I care more about us getting along yeah. than us agreeing. And if they're not willing to accept that, yeah, if they're not willing to accept that, like if, let's say Don and I uh, disagreed on, on anything, We've had a few of them. And, and yeah, but you know, <laughs> I, I, in 15 years, I, I can't recall a, a, an argument with Don and I that got Ugly. as heated as any of the right, major right, right. callers. Now, we had a vehement disagreement on the logical absolutes at some point, <laughs> in which now that I have a better understanding of what he was saying, he was right. Uh, but Golly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it, fundam it fundamentally, over a long period of time, helped change the way that I, I listen to talk about that. But if I said to Don... I would prefer that we never discuss this topic again because all it does is create tension. We're better off not discussing it. And Don agrees, cool, that's somebody who genuinely cares about our relationship. And if Don goes, hell no, you're wrong and I'm still coming at you left and right, then my thing is, bye, Felicia. <laughs> right, yeah. Unfortunately, when it's family, it, it can get a little... I know. Heated. I mean, they, they'll take liberties with you that a friend may not. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and you know, even though they claim they're not judging you, they really are. I mean, I yes. mean, it's just, I'm sorry, I see it that way. I feel like I'm being scrutinized every single time I'm in front of them. And even a simple little thing like them saying a prayer, you know, saying grace before dinner, if I choose to say amen or not say amen, it always becomes a point of contention. Oh, then I'd never say it. 
I will stand quietly yeah, while people in my family pray over their meal as if that's going to make it not give them salmonella. Uh, I will stand quietly and pray. But if any of them ever expect me to say amen at the end of it, they're in for a rude awakening because that will never fucking happen. It's just like I had no, I had no desire to ever draw Muhammad until Muslims told me I couldn't. And then I will. I'm a, I'm a veteran. I have no desire to burn a flag until somebody tells me I can't. And then I will be producing videos of me burning flags left and right in all different configurations to show how absolutely ridiculous this particular idea is. I'm going to borrow something that Jen Peoples said years ago, which has always stuck with me, which is your family if you act like family. And in my case, I don't care if we're related by blood as kin. Either we have a relationship that's family or we don't. And I have people who I consider family who I'm not related to in any close sense. And there are people who I am direct blood relatives to uh, that are definitely not family of mine. They're relatives. And that's relatively comforting right. when I don't have to talk to them. Yeah. It sounds to me, just kind of reading, th reading through the, between the lines here, that you're um, uh, being a little too, a little too easygoing, a little too, giving them a little too much power in, in, the, in these relationships. And you may need to pull that back. Well, I, I will admit that I'm not, I, I mean, you're right. You're right. Like I, I've been just the last week or so listening to you guys and, and I wish I had not, um, what's the word, uh, gumption or what do you call it? Uh, anyway, you know what I mean? Just, I wish I had militant, the militant atheist. Assholishness. <laughs> No, no, I didn't say that. No, well. no, 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 no. Uh, other people how, how would. About, how about courage of your convictions? Uh, it, it, okay, let's the, the real difference. The real difference is that while I am not as keen on controversy as some people would think that I am, uh, I'm actually far more interested in you know diplomacy and and trying to. I, I am the peacemaker in a number of things. Some of which we'll find out in a week or so, and some other stuff. It's not. It's not that I have something you don't. It's that you haven't been pushed to that breaking point yet where you have to make the hard decisions. You, you are a good, caring person who doesn't want to end relationships with your family, even if it hurts you, because it still hasn't reached the point where it hurts you more than the benefits that you get out of it or the fear of being completely ostracized. So we would be remiss if we didn't mention a couple things, especially with Daryl Ray coming down next weekend. You should look into the Recovering from Religion organization and potentially the Secular Therapist Project. And I know that there is an atheist organization in Ottawa. Um, and find some like-minded people that you can use as a place to vent and, and potentially other people other than us non-experts uh, to talk to about how best to manage your life, where you can be more open than you can be calling into a TV show. Okay. Um, I wrote that down. Thank you. Thank right. you. Good luck to you. Appreciate your time, Melanie. And by all means, call us back and let us know if things have improved or gotten worse. And uh, gotten worse. And wow. we're, we're sure. Yeah, I don't speak we'll, English. We'll I, I'm to, American. We'll try to give you better advice next time. Worser, worserer. <laughs> okay. That was a worsererist <laughs> mistake I've made today. All right. We got Hugh in. Uh, oh, New Zealand. How are you? Yeah. Good. Just. Having a big anxiety attack. Are, are you are you north or south? Sorry. Are you north or south? Uh, north Island. Okay. okay. Well, did I did I get to meet you when I was there? No. Uh, no. Sorry. Okay. I hope to come back. It's you went to Auckland, didn't you? I went to you Auckland, went to Auckland, and it's yeah, yeah. So I loved my trip to Australia, and it was fine. I have never been any place where a. I felt more comfortable and that was prettier. Uh, I will say that New Zealanders seem to have the most casual relationship with time of anybody I've ever met. <laughs> like, I'm stressed. I like to get places earlier. And the guy that was driving us around is like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, we'll get there. It's not a big deal. And we were like late everywhere. <laughs> but, right. What do you got for us today, though? How can we help? Well, um, 
Yeah, okay, where do I start? Um, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't have a TV, so I read a lot of books, and I used to love the books about gods and stuff, you know, and I read about them all, you know, the Pacifica gods and the European gods and stuff. And, I mean, you know, I've never been a believer, and the thing that gets me is that the, the stories are an attempt to explain reality. Right? Right. And so my attitude is like, why why just cut out the why not just cut out the middleman and go straight to the reality and just take God, God as a label for reality? Sounds well, good to me. No, that doesn't. No. Oh, I'm all in favor of let's just cut out the middleman and let's just deal with reality. I just don't see any reason to call reality God because all that does oh, is yes. is give power and lip service. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I don't see any reason to either because there's a whole lot of baggage, but it's not my baggage and and you know my my again you know. It's, when I was younger, I wasn't a believer, and I came up against all these people who were. Sure. And I, I actually have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder because a lot of atheists are ex-theists, and they used to give me shit when they were theists. Right. And I used to, you know, like, what are you talking about? And now they're atheists, and I'm saying, well, I just, you know, think that it's reality. And they go, oh, no, 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 you know. And it's like, well, make up your mind, you know. I, I've always believed in reality. Reality is amazing. Yeah, it is. It's what, awesome. What, you know, instead of old books and, and stuff, which you can interpret any way you like, um, just examine reality. That's that's the truth. That's where the truth is. That's the thing that's consistent for everybody. All these stories are inconsistent. You know, but just yeah. Hugh, have you people when they talk about God? I say so, sorry. Have you ever considered leaving the the paradise in which you reside and moving to Austin, Texas? Because I'd put you on the show uh, <laughs> to say this thing to everybody. <laughs> But he just did. But, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll do it remote because we have to. No, I, I have been trying to get through for a while. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I mean, I say to p people like, um, is, do you think God is real, right? So, and they go, yeah. And I say, so it's part of reality, right? Is it a subset of reality? Oh, it can't be a subset. Well, then it's the whole thing. So get rid of your book and just focus on reality. That I mean, might the, be a good yeah, tactic the, the to, uh, to that change, I will change say the conversation. Amen to. Yeah, I won't say amen to dinner oh. prayers, but I'll say amen to that. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean, I've actually heard people bring this up in in shows in the past, and they said, "Well, God is reality," and you said, "Well, we've already got a word for reality; it's reality." But yeah. if you're going to define something, you have to use other words. Sure, you know what I mean. So it's like, but and so the problem is, is that while God isn't particularly well defined, it normatively applies to a conscious thinking agent of immense power. How powerful, I mean... Yeah, and that's, that's, that's my problem with atheism. It's like you, 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 you kind of still got your baggage. You still drag in this belief that you used to have along with you instead of just like cut it away and no. just like focus on reality. Instead of arguing the toss about whether... No, no, the, Hugh. This bullshit story is real or not. It's clearly not. No, you. here's where you completely lose me so you won't be the new co-host. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Because a fact, a fact about reality is that the overwhelming majority of people in reality believe in gods. And this impacts their decision-making and the way they vote, which impacts the rights and privileges of everybody around them. That's the reason to argue agree, this. Yeah. The reason to argue this isn't, oh, gosh, I used to believe that silly shit you believed, and now I'm just so much smarter and so much better. No, it is about this stuff has a real impact. So I could go live my life and ignore the God thing, but I would be ignoring the single biggest elephant in reality. Yeah, yeah but, but what's what I'm trying to do, I, it, there needs to be a, a kind of a, a meeting point because if, if we just argue the God belief versus reality, you, you're just not going to get anywhere. I, well, bullshit, you, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. No, 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 no. You're going to change some people. Yeah, but, I have thousands of emails from people who've changed their mind. Yeah. Thousands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So isn't that worth it? But, not with everybody will you change I'm, their minds. And and uh, as, as Matt said, we're often we're often really trying to reach the audience, and, and we may or may not change the mind of the caller. Yeah. And and so it may seem like it's a futile exercise. I would I would have done this for 15 years, and I said this. I did a debate in uh, Amarillo, and uh, a young 12, 13 year old girl came up to me to say that. And I've told this story before, so I'll keep it brief. In any, any case, she had been considering a bunch of different religious views, and she came up to say, "Thanks because of what you said tonight, I now identify as an atheist." And I would do another 15 years of batshit crazy calls and arguing until I'm yelling and hanging up for one more 15-year-old girl. And yet we already know 
this show and the debates and the other efforts that we do have literally helped thousands of people. Some of them it's helped find their way out of religion. Some of them it helps them find their way to be more comfortable out of religion. As with the last caller of dealing with family members, it's not futile to have these discussions, even though I will admit on many occasions it appears futile. And one of the better examples... No, no, no. One of the better examples is there was a guy who used to call the show on a weekly basis or every couple of weeks. And he thought I was an asshole and he thought I was wrong and he kept arguing and he kept getting shut down and he'd argue and he'd get shut down. And finally he stopped calling. But about three years later, he sent me an email and said, hey, I'm not going to tell you my name, but I stopped calling three years ago and started listening and taking notes with the sole purpose of finding a way to prove you wrong. And now I'm an atheist. Sometimes it takes time. Yeah. Yeah, but, okay. Yeah, I, I understand that it makes a difference, but it, I just think it's best to focus on... Because even atheists are saying, well, you know, there's a possibility the supernatural is, is real. I'm not. It's like, for me, I just can't believe that anyone could think... The supernatural, by definition, is made up. You can't demonstrate it in reality. It's, it's an imaginary thing. And yet there are people who are convinced they've seen ghosts and had experiences with all sorts of supernatural stuff. Yeah, but, but that's, that, and that's what I'm saying. To those people, you've got to explore the, 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 the facts around this. Like, people see things because we have, we've got a, we're a biological organism and we right. have problems with our brains. So what, so is, gonna, got, what um, is going to encourage I those people? I see hallucinations all the time. I hear things, but I know that they're not real because I do a little bit of research. And, you know, it's quite interesting, this stuff about schizophrenia that's been done at how, the moment where people... How do you sorry. convince people to do that work and investigate? Because when they think they have the right answer, that's where investigation stops. Why would you keep looking for an answer if you think you have one? How do you convince somebody that they might not have the right answer and continue investigating if you don't engage in the way we and do? And God belief is a one-size-fits-all rationalization. Yeah, it's, it's being supported from around. But I don't know. There are people whose minds will change and people whose minds won't. I don't know how to tell the difference between those people. So I'm going to talk to all of them as if they can potentially change their mind. Yeah. And there yeah, may be some differences just, between the culture there in New Zealand, New Zealand versus the culture I here in the United that, States. That is a big part. That yeah. is a big part of it because we just don't have religion and politics. I mean, not, the politicians, you know, some of them are religious, but they don't sort of force it on people. Oh, it's your blessings. I think we're about... <laughs> as, like, as much, it, as it, much. It, <laughs> we still have a little bit of an issue around abortion and yeah. stuff like that. But um, I know I, in America, I, I mean, I look at it and just think... Your people are insane. I mean, we, we have lost our minds. I, I agree. <laughs> Not but me. I, but I will, say, I will say you should probably reach out to the group in Auckland that I worked with because they seem to be aware of a whole bunch of problems of religion encroaching on in government. So even when I was in this paradise of New Zealand thinking I had maybe escaped the bat shittery for a while, it turns out I hadn't. It's just that I live in a country that's so bat shit... Uh, New Zealand looks like a paradise when there are still problems there as well. No, oh, yeah, that was part of a, a movement to try and get uh, Jesus taken out of the prayer when they opened Parliament, which they just recently did. I think it only All happened right. last year. So. Did you guys get your new flag yeah. yet? No. Okay. No, there was a bit of controversy about that. Yeah, I, I loved watching it on John Oliver, yeah. but... I tell you what, I, yeah, I appreciate the I appreciate the the call, Hugh, and okay. we're largely on the same page. I hope to come back to New Zealand. Yeah. If you ever make it to Austin, you're welcome to come down to the Atheist Community of Austin yeah, as well. Join us. We're going to let you go and move on to some other callers, but thanks for your time, and there's still people on the other side of the glass. We are now up against the wall, and I have three callers left for us to get to. Okay. You didn't do a lightning round? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you <laughs> pick one and take the whole thing yourself so that you know when to end it. Oh, my goodness. What? I, I, <laughs> Okay, let's be honest. We know that I'm probably going to say something. Oh, but I'm going to endeavor. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, number four, then. Number four. Adrian in Texas, you're on with Don Baker. Hey, Adrian. <laughs> hey, Don. Matt likes to do this trick to me. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, I can. What do you got for us today? Okay. You want to talk about uh -huh. intelligent design, right? Right, I just wanted to uh, talk about what I believe and why. Okay, uh, great. I believe in a creator God uh, because of all the evidence that was left behind, like the uh, 
the moon and the uh, and DNA and uh, the tilt of the Earth. And, uh, Adrian, didn't you edited. didn't you literally call and have the same conversation with me a couple weeks ago? Uh, yeah, but I, okay, I, I just to, wanted to check. I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> we we could give you the same answer if we, we invoke Matt here. <laughs> yeah, I, w I wanted to talk to both you. I just want uh, wanted to talk to. So, so I don't, I don't believe that there's a, a creator. Uh, I have, I haven't seen Sorry. any solid evidence of a creator. Um, you know, there are things that that might appear designed, but uh, there are processes that do these sorts of things. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, Don. What you just said there. Okay. To be designed. That's what the experts are also saying, like uh, okay. Richard Dawkins about DNA, and. Uh, you know, about the moon and Jupiter, the position of Jupiter, they say, protects us from asteroid strikes and uh, plate tectonics and okay. magnetic well, the, you're, you're, uh, boy, why don't we pick one? I, I believe I said that last time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff here. Yeah. Why don't, why don't yeah. you pick one no, and I, we'll, I, we'll talk about it a little bit and then we'll move on to another caller. Right. I know there's a lot of them. So, yeah. Pick, uh, you know, we give me your best time, one. So How about that? Just, uh, you're right. <clears throat> the best, I mean, the, I guess we'll just, we'll just start with DNA. DNA. Oh, okay. So okay. DNA is a, uh, is a complex chemical, right? That has the ability to make copies of itself, right? Right. Okay. And sometimes there are mistakes or, or, or things that can go on with that copying process to create different versions. And then there's this recombination, this, uh, this double, double helix thing that can be, uh, you know, you get part from your father, part from your mother, right? And so you, the, the uh, genes that are expressed in you uh, are a combination of the, your parents. Very good, yes. Okay. That's true. Um, so where is, where is God in all that? Oh, uh, we... Just like what you said earlier, how it uh, looks to be designed, uh, that's also what experts like Richard Dawkins are also saying. Now, I'm pretty sure you're uh, quote mining him and, and getting giving the getting the wrong answer there. He he. Well, yeah, he did go on to say that he doesn't know, and I'll 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 you know go okay, on. Well, the time that. the time to believe something is when you have positive evidence for it, right? Not not because something right. appears the way that you you kind of like like the answer. So do we have a, do we have any evidence of of God coming in and tinkering with DNA or or having created it in the first place or something like that? Yes, yes, we do. We do. Yes. Awesome. So can you expand on that? Yes, this, uh, it just looked that way. It appears that way. And uh, there's a lot of other things also that just okay. Have we're, that we're sticking with DNA though, right? right? Right for now. For now. So you 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 have you have some right. evidence that that God did what with DNA? Well, it appears to be designed, and I guess a designer would would uh, be like a godlike something godlike, right? Or or something that we would consider okay. godlike. So, uh, so it might appear that way, but uh, is it is it really that way? Do you have evidence that it is that way? Right, right. That's uh, that's also uh, like how people can go to jail and they uh, they get out later. Whenever the evidence they find evidence later that that proves them innocent, we can always let them let them out of jail later. And I have no problem with letting God out of jail. It's just right now that you just you just want to believe without without to, really right. strong evidence um, because well, of some, right now the evidence that's what the evidence shows, and that's why people go to jail that are innocent. But uh, you know, there's a lot of people that do go to jail okay. that Matt, are guilty. Matt's, Matt's and it's squirming because over they here. Look guilty. Uh, so are it's are you suggesting are you suggesting that because that it's okay to lock up innocent people based on evidence that's clearly flawed because later we found out they were not guilty? No, if you're being honest, you'll let them out of jail once you find that they're Holy innocent. Holy shit. But if it looks like they're... 
You shouldn't put them into jail in the first time. What that means, anytime you find out later that somebody was clearly innocent, we need to leave, let them out of jail, that means you fucked up in the initial decision. So let's avoid that. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. Lots of things, lots of, lots of things can give the appearance of design because that's what we're uh, tuned to project. And your, your reasoning is such that if it appears designed, I'm going to believe it's designed until it's not. But if you apply that reasoning universally, you will be convinced that I have magic powers because I am an expert at giving the appearance of having magic powers. And if you can't explain how I do a trick, you, in order to be consistent, would have to conclude that Matt has magical powers. Are you willing to do that? Yeah, we would have a lot. Are of you willing to do that? If if we went by the logic that you're using, uh, we would have a lot of guilty guys. Yes, we would. Yes, right we now. would. But we wouldn't have innocent people dying and being locked up and giving up their lives. Better that a hundred guilty men go free than one innocent man goes to prison. But that's not the question I ask. I agree. It's I not agree. the question. Yeah, you, you don't I agree. You don't agree. You don't agree. And that's, that's not the I'm question. I Stop. I'm not. Stop. That's not the question I asked. If I do a magic trick that you can't explain, are you going to be convinced that I have magic powers? No, no, not if it's a No, trick. and you even laughed at it, which exposes how ridiculously you are engaged in a set of special pleading. When it comes to God, which you want to believe in, you will take the appearance of a God as evidence for a God. But you don't want to believe that Matt's got magical powers, so the appearance of Matt having magical powers, you will laugh and mock and toss aside. No, I'm saying we have to have evidence to prove that you don't have magical powers and otherwise. We have to prove that... No, no, no. You just said you would not believe that I had magical powers, and now you're suggesting that we need to have evidence that I don't. Yeah, of course. You do need evidence for everything. You know that, Matt. I'll yes. that from you. And, so, so but you the appearance of design is not evidence of design. It is. It is. No, it's it is not. not By definition, the word appearance makes it distinct from actual. If I say I can give the appearance of magic, that's different from me saying I can do magic. So the reason yeah, we put the word the reason we put the word appearance on there is a recognition that at first blush, you could look at this and go, wow, that kind of looks designed, but you know that you should not reach that conclusion. Otherwise, you would not include the word appearance. You'd just say design because you'd actually have evidence for design, but you don't have that and you can't get it. And that's why you are selectively no. agreeing that appearance of design is enough to convince you that a God exists until somebody proves you wrong, which is a shifting of the burden of proof, which we told you two weeks ago, so we're moving on to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody we, who we thought I was actually going to stay, so Matt wants to brush this along. So good. For also, you, there's Matt. pizza coming. And I haven't. Really, <laughs> I've had like one donut all day long. Uh-oh. Uh oh. Yeah. Michelle in Ontario, you're on with Donna Matt. Uh, hi, Mr. Dillahunty, Mr. Baker. Uh, it must be your evening for speaking to Canadian ladies. I'm in. Uh, yeah, I'm north of Lake Huron, and oh, wow. I, I want to. Oh, sorry. I wanted to ask you, from your perspective, how do you understand and how do you uh, frame the notion that most uh, First Nations have very strong senses of spirituality, of the sacred? Sure, that's and, easy. Uh, if you look, if you, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's easy. Okay, that. There are no perfect right. thinkers, including in First Nation uh, Native Americans, etc., People are prone to making mistakes. They are human just like everybody else. And when they see something that appears to be designed, some of them are going to leap to design. And when they see things uh, that appear to not have an explanation, they are going to infer that there's something spiritual about that. They can be wrong just like everybody else. Well, I was wondering about, uh, in particular, the, the legend of Hiawatha, which is related to the coming together of the five Iroquois nations as the, uh, as the Iroquois people. Uh, I, I'm not talking about the, the poem by Longfellow, the Hiawatha poem, but the actual legend of how, um, and this is depending on which uh, version of it you read online, there's various different ones, but they, they, they date this back to 1400 uh, before Christopher Columbus ever cross the ocean, so before there was any cross-contamination from, um, say, uh, 
the European uh, faiths or Asian faiths. So, uh, and the legend goes that uh, in those times, the five nations, the Mohawk, Seneca, Oneida, Cayuga, and Onondaga, were at each other's throats constantly. And that this young warrior, Hiawatha, uh, lost his wife and daughters. And, and one version says they died of a disease. Another version said they were killed by a neighboring tribe. Well, if it's we have hard. different versions, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> isn't, isn't that obviously yeah, just cherry-picking the version that seems to be? No, but because they both lead to a common point. And that the common point is that Hiawatha was just discouraged. His friend said, well, let's do what we usually do, i.e. Uh, get a war party together and go out and take out our angst and our anger on the neighboring tribe, which is why the five tribes were constantly at each other's throat. I don't but understand. Had no... I... It's getting somewhere, if you could bear with me. Okay, I just, um, I'm, I'm trying to, I don't understand the point. Well, the point is that he was heartbroken. He went into the forest. He wanted to die. And there he met the great peacemaker, who was a figure which came out of nowhere and who the people, the, the Iroquois people say this figure was sent from the creator and the, uh, the great peacemaker. What parts of the story are demonstrably true? At, and teaches Hiawatha how to have compassion and together they bring the five nations together. And uh, so the, it is an important part of the self the identity of the Iroquois people. It does call upon the notions of spirituality, of revelation, of a creator God. And it is part of that First Nation. Many First Nations have... But at the end of the day... So at the end of the day, it's just a story that people found compelling that achieved a goal. That doesn't mean anything about the story is true. I could disappear and go off into the woods for a while and come back to the atheist community of Austin and say, I've just made the great, great peacemaker and I have the information that's going to bring us all back together. And as long as I'm convincing and it works, people will forever tell the story of how I met the great peacemaker. Well, that's when, when Maybe he deserves a the credit, perfect. perhaps. The big thing is, yeah, if is there is, is no, 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 it's worse than, true. it's worse than that, Michelle, because if there is a great peacemaker, and much like alien abductors, he's only meeting with one person in the woods to pass on a message, he's a dick. He's not the great peacemaker. He's a manipulator. A great peacemaker well, people, wouldn't have waited for one person to go off in the woods. The great peacemaker would have walked in in front of everybody and said, I am the great peacemaker, and here's how we fix this. Instead, the great peacemaker decided to go off and, you know, meet with one person to pass on the message. This is exactly like Moses being the spokes, or actually, sorry, Aaron being the spokesperson for Moses being the spokesperson for God. It's, may, may it's a story. Say, sure. May I? Thank you. Um, the legend does talk about how it was a progressive revelation that took time and that the great peacemaker worked with Hiawatha progressively to bring the five nations together. But beside that, and beside everything you've said, uh, my, my, my query to you is, don't you think that everything you've said and, and your atheist perspective isn't a bit of a uh, European colonial Western take? on spirituality and in your view if the world would be such a better place without religions and with just this atheist perspective isn't that a little bit racist towards all no and that's some absolutely uh, bizarre bullshit to suggest that an entirely intellectual exercise to say where is the evidence and when i look at these stories i didn't say hey the great spirit uh, could have done these things because I am being racist against First Nation people. I'm saying it because it's a bullshit, ridiculous reason to believe something. And as I pointed out, we're all human and we're all guilty of that kind of thing. How dare you remotely suggest that because I'm a privileged white guy, Western European, that I'm poo-pooing a Native American story, which I'd never considered prior to today, when it is ridiculous well, at its face. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
Well, I, I think it does sound very racist. Well, fuck you. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. I don't know. <laughs> and I have no idea what race you are, but fuck you. Because if your response to proper skepticism to say, hang on a second, let me make sure I understand the story. This guy goes off in the woods and supposedly gets a secret message and comes back and relates it to everybody. Here's a number of problems with that. To suggest that my dismissal of it was because I'm a racist just puts you in the position of people I no longer need to speak with. And, and if, it's, if it's evidence that uh, is, is not sufficient or, or if, if that's something that uh, is not going to get us to the truth, Present us with what is, and let's talk about it. By the way, in a side note, as long as I'm saying fuck you to people, um, I got a message on my phone that said, uh, here, I'll read it. Um, this is one of the reasons why I don't spend any time in the, in the uh, live chat during the show, because it would be a monumental distraction. Live YouTube comments on the show are making derogatory comments about your statement, quote, if I could have one more 15-year-old girl... <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> so, so now when I say something, you're, you're going to be like, oh, clearly Matt's a pederast and he just <laughs> wants them young girls. If you can't get the context out of that story, that it was worth it for me to put this effort in, if one more 15-year-old girl abandoned religion or one more anybody abandoned religion, you're just as dipshitty as the person who wants to dismiss skepticism as if I was, it was rooted in racism. Am I racist? Yeah, probably. Guess what? So are you. Am I a normal human being who may have been instilled with biases and bigotry about people who are different from me? Yeah. The difference is, is that rather than running around dismissing skepticism on the grounds of racism and dismissing honest statements uh, in order to make a, a potential, potentially even joking accusation about something else, I actually have been working to change myself and eliminate those things as best as I can with the understanding that I'm never going to get there. But you know what I'm also never going to do? When somebody calls in to tell me, well, you just don't believe in God because you don't like my particular heritage, I'm not going to say, well, you're just racist against white guys. <laughs> the whole world's coming down on white guys. <laughs> Fuck white guys. <laughs> Fuck white guys especially. <laughs> there. Hey, Abe, thanks for waiting. You, you are the last caller. You're in New Jersey, and you're on with Matt and Don. Uh, hey, guys. How is everything? Uh a mess. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I just saw you. You're, you're destroying her over there. It's funny. Yeah, I'll try not to be racist. <laughs> <laughs> what have you got for us okay, today? Well, uh, so I have all. So um, let me first say that uh, I'm a I'm a Muslim, and uh, I have to say that I've been listening to your guys' show recently for quite some time, and it's very interesting. And I think that you're you bring a lot of good points and. I've been, yeah, I've been considering your viewpoints for quite some time. That's and great. Thank cool. you. I, I, yeah, I appreciate you doing that. Yeah, so I, so basically what I want to present, I just want to, pre I want to present this argument that a lot of Muslims and like, they, they present this kind of argument and it just, I, I'm, it's, there's just something particularly strange about it. Like, it's just like, it's strangely convincing, but I don't know if it should be convincing. Okay, but that's I'll, good I'll because you're, it sounds like your your bullshit detector is is going off. So let's 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 hear it and let's tear it apart. Okay, yeah, yeah. So okay, so basically the first okay, so the first part part of this is is that in the in the in the Quran, uh, the Quran presents a literary and linguistic challenge to humanity. So basically, in like the first chapter of the Quran, uh, it it presents this challenge. It says that if you doubt that this book was written by God, then produce something like it. And that's supposed to mean not like a, as a subjective literary judgment, but more like a produce something that's even of similar quality in terms of literary merit. Okay, we can stop so there. Like the we can stop there. That's a fallacy. That something is true until it's shown to be false. So the uniqueness of the Quran, which... Every book is unique, except for cop uh -huh. copies of the book. But th Christians use the same thing. They talk about the uniqueness of the Bible, the uniqueness of prophecy, the uniqueness of what Jesus supposedly fulfilled, etc. Muslims do the same thing with the Quran. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how unique it is. It doesn't matter whether somebody could produce something remotely similar. That is not a testimony to the truth of the claims within the book, period. 
Yeah, so uh, no, I understand what you're saying. So I guess what Muslims are trying to say, they're trying to say that it's inimitable in the sense that... I don't it care. ...it not have been written... That's not relevant. The fact that you couldn't... Yeah. I'm, first of all, I'm not conceding that it's true. I'm saying even if it were true, that doesn't change whether or not this is a book that speaks on behalf of God. Uh-huh. So, yeah, um, I guess, uh, well, the thing is, is that what, so th what they're trying to say is, so I, because I've, I've heard this argument from like uh, a couple of, I guess, apolog uh, Muslim apologists, mm -hmm. and what they're, what they're trying to say is basically not like, all like. They're the trying to say that the only way this book could be unique is if it actually comes from God. That is a bald assertion that they do not demonstrate, that they cannot demonstrate at all. Mm -hmm. it, they, are, they are snowing you. They are buffaloing you. They are bullshitting you. They bullshitted themselves. They're saying this book is so clearly and obviously important that it must have come from God. No man could produce this book. While simultaneously yeah. acknowledging that a man actually, you know, dictated and wrote the book but they do it with oh well this is with the guidance of Allah and no man on its own could put, could produce this which I don't accept is actually true but I don't care because even if it were true that nobody else could produce this other than the individual who did that doesn't mean that he could only produce it because he was communicating with God that that this this video for this week I shit you not is going to be assuming facts not in evidence because that's what's happening over and over and what they're essentially doing is saying we're convinced that this could only come about from a God, and we will remain convinced until you prove that something like this could come about from something other than God. Here's the problem. You can say that about the Quran. You can say that about the Bible. You can say that about the Bhagavad Gita. You can say that about the Urantia stuff. You can say that about um, uh, Nostradamus' writings. You can say that about anybody about, and any about writing. Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you could say that about a numeracy. John Allen Paulus's book that I recommend all the time. You could say nobody but John Allen Paulus, with the with the guidance of a god, could have produced a book like a numeracy. And even if that, even if there were no way to demonstrate that, that was wrong, that does not prove that, that God was involved. Yeah, it's, that, it's that, an that, attempt yeah, to shift the burden of proof. Sense, yeah. yeah, it it is prove me wrong. And if you've set up an unfalsifiable scenario, the easiest thing you can ever do is say, I'm going to believe until you prove me wrong. And you'll never be proved wrong because you have an unfalsifiable claim. If there's no way to falsify it, it's not a claim worth considering. Yeah, so no, that makes sense. Uh, I guess, like, the way I think about it is that you have, so you have this book, and there had to, there had to have been some agent who wrote this book, right? You have a book, there needs to be an explanation for who wrote it, right? Usually then, books have authors, yeah? Yeah, yeah, so it has to have an author. So what um, what they're trying to say is that a person could not have written the book. Okay, prove it. Whatever they claim. If they are claiming it is impossible for a person to write this book without God, they need to actually demonstrate that. It's not up to you to disprove it. You're buying into the thing that they're doing where they're shifting the burden of proof. Um, yeah, so uh, so what I was trying to do is I wasn't trying to say like, oh, you have to disprove it. I was, I was trying That's to say That's what they're like, saying. Yeah, so I was trying to like, I, so they're, what they do is like, they, they like show all these like quotes. They give all these quotes from like, uh, like, linguistic scholars or whatever and they say oh these quotes they what they consist of like scholars saying oh the in terms of linguistic merit like the quran is very good or whatever and and it's just like okay so that doesn't necessarily mean that it's from god but you have and it doesn't mean it's true you have to have some but you but you have to have some you have to like there needs to be a best explanation and you have to rule out other explanations. Yeah, like but the, the problem here is that while there is an explanation, that doesn't mean anybody necessarily has access to it at any given point. Yeah. 
And it, ha- and it has yeah. no bearing on whether the, the book is true, right? I mean, yeah, literary yeah, criticism, I mean, that's, that's pretty weak evidence in my mind. <laughs> yeah, the re- yeah, the, like, I was, like, it, the thing about, like, like, I don't know, like, I was a little skeptical of it because it just, the pro- like, if you say, like, tr- like, literary, like, judgment is not, like, it, it's not very objective. Right, in its basis. right. So I, I just... That's why I was like, it just like it doesn't, it didn't seem right a little bit, you know. So yeah, that well, was, I would, yeah, I would well. demand better evidence, right? Because that's pretty, pretty poor yeah. evidence. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, you got, yeah, that makes sense, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to like, because like I never really like heard a response from like atheists like to this kind of argument like i've like i've heard like responses to like you know the Quran yeah. being well, it's kind of a scientific miracles <laughs> it's kind of a weak tea argument we we roll our eyes at that sort of thing <laughs> yeah hey, you know so i'll just I, I pulled up kind of like random quran stuff uh and of course it's in english so all the muslims that are getting ready to send me hate mail for saying i didn't get it right tough I, I'm going with what I have access to. Right, you can uh, read it in Arabic, man. So, uh, <laughs> those who disbelieve will be burned in the fire. That's three one sixteen. I could have written that. Anybody attempting, to, oh, oh, that's very, very similar to what's written in the Bible. So clearly, we can find individual verses that don't seem remarkable at all. As a matter of fact, they seem like the same manipulative bullshit that's in every other religion where you're trying to threaten somebody into actually believing in worship. So I found at least one verse that clearly anybody without any decent moral compass and with a desire to encourage people to believe them without evidence could certainly write something like that. Uh, I need to know from, from the Muslims exactly which verses do they think could have only been written with the guidance of a god. Because... I don't buy that, but even if they're convinced of it, that still doesn't prove that there's a God. And the big question is, where the fuck is Allah? Why do I have to read what his prophet told me? Why can't he interact with this? When it comes to Christianity, if a Damascus Road experience is good enough for Saul, then it should be good enough for everybody. And when it comes to Islam, if Allah has a message for me, he can come give it to me himself. Yeah. He's all powerful, right? I'm waiting. Yeah, and also I- <laughs> Not for you. For Allah. Yeah. For the yeah, other I'll garbage like- concept that's been shoved down people's throats to manipulate everything for, for millennia. Well, not millennia, 700 years. Yeah, that's no, no, I agree. I, I think. I'd also argue that if, if, if there was a God that was going to inspire a book, uh, where it was clear that only God could have inspired this book, maybe he should have picked a prophet that wasn't into little girls. <laughs> okay. We don't need to go there. Yes, we do. <laughs> no, no, no. This is, this, is, this is the obvious thing. So in Christianity, when God's going to destroy the world, who does he pick to save, to be the progenitor of everybody else who's going to exist? Noah, a drunk, a miserable drunk who curses one of his sons to be slaves of the, of the others, the descendants of him. When Allah needs a prophet, who does he pick? Somebody who's okay with marrying a nine-year-old. Well, uh, I, 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 I would have a say, bigger issue with him, you know, saying, hey, my friend here, uh, I like your wife quite a bit. I should, you should give her to me. Yeah. No, no, no. That's, that's the thing that's always coming up. I have yet to hear any message from any God ever, but I keep hearing from the chosen representatives of that God, and they are all pieces of shit. <laughs> Every fucking one of them have moral failings and character flaws that are beyond what we would accept as tolerable. If I have an important message for everybody, you will get it from me, guaranteed until the day that I'm dead. I don't need a prophet. I don't need somebody to come and be my representative. And if I had to pick someone, like if I'm laid up in the hospital and I had an important message to deliver on the show, I would certainly not pick a monumental piece of shit. On that note, we got to let you go. I appreciate the time. Hopefully that helped out. Uh, Yeah, there's... uh
there's a lot of stuff going on, but there's going to be pizza in the other room. Thanks to everybody who showed up here live. Thanks to the people on the other side of the wall who we've already shown, but we'll show them again because they deserve it. They make things awesome. work and happy. Thanks to Don. And a special closing thank you once again to end off the show the exact same way we started it. To our friends and colleagues who spent countless years of their lives doing exactly this, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs>